Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the briefing room. I'm your host, Abu Hamza. And with me today is Layla Hussain, a local psychotherapist, a mother, <laughs> an active campaigner in, in the FDM campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I had to kind of just I put know. that in I, there. I am kind of psycho. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. And the therapy world just happened to welcome me into their, into perfect, their world. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I mean, look, there's a lot of things that um, the Somali community campaigns on, has issues with. We've got the remittance campaign, the Qad campaign. We have obviously things that we're trying to improve with our education. Mm -hmm. um, but the FGM campaign uh, has been a big part of that as well. You're a very active and influential member of that campaign as well as of the Somali community. Um, and you've been campaigning for FGM obviously with Daughters of Eve. Um, so tell me a little bit about Daughters of Eve, how it started and, and who was involved. Um, <coughs> first of all, I, I've been campaigning against FGM for the past 11 years. The reason I got involved in the campaign was actually, it was a health professional who I met just after giving birth to my daughter, who challenged me on it. And she told me about the law, which I've never heard there was an existing law in this country in the mm. first place. And I think for me, it was that journey really that led me on to, I obviously wanted to protect my daughter from the practice, but then I thought if you get pressured, what's out there for you? You know, what, what kind of support system is out there? There was nothing, really. And for me, it's really bizarre. It was, it started with just me wanting to protect my daughter from the practice, which became, obviously, an 11-year campaign. And before we co-founded Daughters of Eve, I was actually working with the African Well Women's Service in Watham Forest yeah. for about six, seven years. And Nimka Ali and Zainab Abdi, who co-founded Daughters of Eve with me, were the women who used to come to the sessions, and Nimco used to come to one of my workshops. She's, um, I remember I met her when she traveled from Bristol to one of my workshops. And at the time, I think it was the first time I kind of had did a big story on my own story at the time that came out on Look magazine. And I think somehow these young women started coming through. Obviously, they didn't want anyone seeing their faces at the time, and mm. I don't blame them because of the backlash um, some of us would have received. But when the NHS were having their cuts in 2009-10, we were one of the first services they got rid of in Watson Forest. And <coughs> really the story behind Daughter of Eve, Nimco and Zainab actually got together and said, if Leda doesn't get back on this campaign, there'll be a big void, basically. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of colluded behind my back and thought, okay, you know, what should we call it? What should it look like? So they wanted to give me something for me to work on. But when they presented it to me, and I realized that might have work they put in, and I said, why don't we go to, together as a group? Because it'd be weird for me not to acknowledge your part in yeah. this. And for me, it was important to have three women, all obviously originally from Somali, but we were all British. And this is something that a lot of the organizations were not working with. Everybody was working with women. Only women, when I say women, women my mum's age. Yeah. But nobody was working with young British girls and young British women. And for us, it was really looking at that gap and see how we can fill that gap with re whether it's with other organizations or uh, working with schools, working with young people. So that's really how oh, Daughters of Eve really came up. It started. So it was, a. to be honest, when we decided we were going to do we were eating halloumi cheese. <laughs> yes. Over food, a lot of decisions can be made. And that's really what happened. Good, good. I mean, it's. You mentioned the law, um, and obviously that you weren't aware of it, and that there are certain things that you need to be able to uh, change, because obviously how can you protect yourself and your daughter mm. uh, moving forward, and what services are available. Mm. Um, more recently, the Home Affairs Committee uh, opened an inquiry into FGM. Um, they have held a few sessions, they're currently preparing their reports. What do you think will it, that its impact will be? I mean, have you been involved in, in, in the report itself? Um, and what do you expect its outcome to be? Um, myself and Nimka Ali were the first people to give evidence in the inquiry. So it was interesting because, um, you know, uh, and, and especially someone like me who's watched a lot of inquiries through the TV. So mm -hmm. it was really a really weird situation to be in that position. But I mean, we didn't get really hard questions because, you know, we were the campaigners and I don't think Keith Vaz his aim was to attack us mainly. What we were asked was how can we make sure we prevent this from happening to other children? And you know, we shared our views and why FGM and has it been picked up in this country? I mean, I mainly always have focused on, I said, we can't talk about FGM if we're not gonna talk about race, gender and sex, because mm -hmm. first of all, it affects, the mo main children it affects is black children, even though we know it's happy, FGM happens in the Middle East and parts of Asia. 
but majority are black children and gender because it affects women and so the, the reason girls go for FGM is mainly because they're girls and no one talks about sex because the whole point of FGM is to control the women's sexuality and I, I wanted the, the panel to really understand you know it's not so simple as how are we going to stop FGM but you need to get to the root of the problem first and actually understand why this is practiced but I did end up going to some of the other sessions and you know the police and education got a mm. good grilling I don't know if you watched uh, some of the pieces I remember just sitting in the corner on the other side and I was just like oh my god but you know it, I think it's it's about time I think I mean we've had uh, an act since, um, since 1985 not one um, um, prosecution not what okay. nothing happened I mean, we'll, I'll be mm. uh, looking at the prosecution aspect mm. uh, a little bit later but mm. you touched on uh, obviously them uh, looking into it and you doing uh, you testifying obviously it, the Met Police was involved the Crown yeah. Prosecution Service the NSPCC See, yep. um, there's a lot of people yeah, yeah. but the campaign the way it's going right now a lot of people are afraid that it's become a Somali issue and it is a yeah. Somali issue but it seems that it's only become a, a Somali only issue yeah. where obviously FGM effect as you said it's, yeah. it's loads of other not just black mm. people but it's also obviously Middle East in the country yeah. but you say black people I think what a lot of people are seeing is just Somali campaigners yes. yep. um, and Somali faces whenever they do leaflets about FGM or anything else like that and that the government's just really focusing on the Somali really? people when yeah. uh, they're, they're wanting to, to restrict or ban uh, FGM why is this and how can this be changed? I think obviously I can see why that could be a negative effect on the community itself but I think my, my response to that has always been the reason you only see the Somali women at the forefront of this campaign is because the Somali community are really the only community who's willing to acknowledge we do have an issue and we need to tackle it so the Somali community are actually out in their hands saying we want this to end. The reason you're not seeing other communities now it's because they're still in, they don't want to talk about it, it's still hidden. Okay. So the Somali community actually need to be complimented for being at the forefront of this campaign. And I think as Somalis, for such an awful, awful vile practice, the fact that it's Somali women who are trying to stop, to me that should be applauded and not dismissed anyway. But I do understand the other side of that argument. But because as Somali women came out, Recently, there's a group of Sierra Leone women who are coming through. Mm -hmm. But those women would, would tell you, if it wasn't for the Somali sisters, we wouldn't have come out. But now the Sierra Leone women are coming through. The other ones will be coming through. We're already having Gambian women who are coming through. Yeah. So it's going to have a ripple effect. But as a Somali woman and other Somali campaigners, we are very proud that we led that campaign. And for us, it's something um, that we... I mean, we would like our community to see it not as a negative, as positive. However, I am one of those people who question a lot of, you know, you, you'll find when certain leaflets are printed, it, no one usually consults with us. So yeah, it's not something that we are really part of. Yeah, it's not something that we are okay. really part of. I mean, you, you mentioned Gambia. There's a 25-year-old there's a from Gambia. Her name is Jaha Dukure. Mm. Um, she's mm. in the US. Mm -hmm. She's campaigning there now as well at the same time. Yes. Um, she's the... Uh, a similar position to the, guy, to the yeah. ones that you guys did. I mean, she's got over 100,000 signatures. Yeah. You guys have got over 100,000 signatures. Um, was the link between the two, pe two petitions, the campaign? I mean, obviously yours was on the, the government's e-petition, e yeah. so for it to be debated in Parliament. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so was there a link between the two? Or? Oh, absolutely. And, and if you look at a lot of uh, Jaha's uh, interview, uh, interviews, I, I'm, I've, I've become quite a very good friend to Jaha, so I've been supporting her, you know, via phone or... Twitter or Facebook like we do these days but you will see in her article she would say you know if it wasn't for the other campaigners like Leila Lightning Co, like Hoda, Sarian and Alimo, these other Sierra Leonean sisters who have spoken out recently, if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be able to speak and I think me being one of the first I would say young Somali women who spoke out a couple of years ago it was a very very isolating position to be in so for me now to have all these women amongst me it feels less isolating but it also feels much more powerful like you don't feel people can just come and attack you know like mm -hmm. you have your own crew yeah, <laughs> you to run to with you. absolutely no, I, I it feels quite protective yeah but but having but with that, obviously with more people getting involved mm. and more people doing things i mean there's a young girl called fahma uh, yes absolutely uh, from bristol she started campaigning yeah. fgm she did her uh, petition she as well Michael she got yeah. like over 250,000 yeah, uh, 230,000 something i think it was mm -hmm. um 
But the moment that she did it, and the Guardian backed her, the government got involved, Malalai suddenly backed her, the UN, you had Ban Ki-moon making statements on this. I mean, why the sudden interest after the young girl does it? And it's because a lot of people, when, when we look at this, we think, okay, wait, it's, they're getting involved, it's great, the attention's mm -hmm. getting there, but is the conversation being steered away from the current campaigners and is the control being mm -hmm. taken away from you guys? And once yeah. the government or the UN uh, start controlling the conversation, I mean, uh, no disrespect to, to Fahma, obviously, but she's a young girl, she's, uh, in, a, in a way, obviously, she has things that she wants to achieve, but mm -hmm. other people might be pushing their agenda at the same time, time. to be able to yeah. do this. Um, is the conversation being stayed away from you guys? Is the, is the campaign being stayed away? Or do you still think that you guys have enough influence on the campaign? Um, I mean, I had nothing to do with... I mean, I supported Fahma's campaign, but it wasn't something that I directly had something to do with. But I do believe, and I remember speaking to a couple of people who signed that petition. They said to me, Leila, we would not sign that petition if it wasn't for the Channel 4 documentary. Because I think we've been campaigning for many years. I think the Evening Standard really kicked off a campaign mm -hmm. Um, the summer 2012, I, whether they were covering Nimco's story, my story, or some of the other issues were coming up. And I think um, then the Channel 4 film obviously came through last year. And I think something blew up. And I think for me, what I've noticed through, you know, obviously working with many campaigners, nobody was calling it for what it, for what it is. In what out way? Loud. I think people constantly kept referring to FGM as it's a cultural practice, you know, it's a religious practice. And, and I think what Daughters of Eve have, has done very well, because a lot of people say to us, you guys only formed in 2010, why did you get to this level of campaigning? I said, we called it for what it was. We called it child abuse. We said it was violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. And these are British girls, and the government, it's there to protect these girls. We shouldn't put that responsibility on the community to protect those girls they should get the same respect as any other British child. We have a policy in this country that says every child matters. Are we picking and choosing? Which and child matters and which one doesn't? Which one doesn't? And you know, for me, that was the argument. But w w when you say something like that, you annoy a lot of campaigners who want to tiptoe. And, be the issue. and, and who want to be, who want to be BFFs with a lot of decision makers. I'm not gonna say no names, but. But, but this, is, this is the thing, the thing is, the decision makers are now getting involved and the ones that are tiptoeing are they the ones who are now controlling the campaign and the conversation a little bit more and it's because i've from what i've seen i feel that it's it's daughters of even a lot of people that we saw were there at the forefront and making all the noise are are rarely being listened to or are just basically sparingly mentioned oh are, we, Hems, are you saying we're being hijacked i, I sincerely believe you are <laughs> Um, but well, what, do you, what, what, what is your opinion? Do you know what? For me, I, I think being, be, being in, in, in the world of campaigning for the last 11 years, I think there's, I, I had to come to, I had to be in peace with the idea of, you, you, you know, you kick something off. If other people want to take it and run with it, it's fine. Personally, for me, Leila, it's fine. But you, I do agree, you, we do need to acknowledge, like even for me now, actually, I would like to acknowledge while I sit here, the reason I ended up speaking against FGM because there were women way before me in the UK, Shamsadiri, who, you know, she was what, one of the she was the person behind the FGM Act in the 1980s. You know, those women for Efra Dokunu, who's she's like the mother of this campaign for 30 years. She's from Ghana. You know, people forget to mention some people like her. But I think I've kind of got used to that. I think I'm in that position now where I think, okay, if other people are going to run with it, but for me, my I, my thing is. If one girl is going to be saved from this, whether it's the postman who's going to dance about mm -hmm. FGM, <laughs> you know, if David Cameron tomorrow wants to start his own new campaign, I really don't care as long as we keep this on the agenda. I don't care who does it. But I do agree, some, it is important to acknowledge those who put, this, who, who put this on the agenda in the first place. And I think what Daughters of Eve did we named and shamed what what FGM actually was, where a lot of organisations were not willing to do because they were worried about what was going to happen. Yes, we did get backlash, but majority, the, there was a bigger community that came through and said, Leila, I knew I was abused, but I just didn't know how to express, it. How to express it. And I think we gave you know, the women from our community as survivors the permission to actually call it that. 
Okay, um, we'll, we'll take a break right there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's obviously we'll discuss uh, some of the prosecutions, the, the, the crew cut as well, um, right after the break, um, and hopefully we'll catch you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the brief room. I'm your host, Abu Hamza. This is the second half. The first half, obviously, we are continuing with our interview with Leila Hussein, uh, co founder of Daughters of Eve. Um, and, and just before the break, we were talking about the campaign itself, the FGM campaign, and how it's happening in the UK, mm -hmm. and um, how that more recently has been hijacked. And obviously, the conversation has been steered away um, with this new Guardian campaign that's come across as well. Um, and and what has been put forward to Michael Gove? I mean, do you know what the, the outcome was of that? Um, from from uh, well, this came up in inquiry that they sent out letters to the school, but we were led to believe through uh, the art the Guardian articles that he wrote about FGM. But what he did was he sent letters about safeguarding issues and just added a little appendix at the bottom, and he sent it to all the schools all over the UK. But there was nothing to help them guide on what it was. And I'm, my fear is some teachers seen this, I don't even know what the hell FGM actually is. And are just going to ignore it, basically? Igno well, actually, what came up in the inquiry was in that letter, it said, I remember Keith, Keith Vibes asking whoever was from uh, the education department, did any of the teachers reply to this? And they said, well, you know, they're very busy. We've sent this to many, many thousands of people. And then it comes up on the letter that they sent out, it said, do not reply. And Keith said, how the hell do you expect teachers to engage if you clearly said in so your do letter? Not reply. And he said, what kind of teacher does an open uh, uh, emails that's from Michael Gove? I mean, I don't know if you saw the Evening Standard piece. I mean, the Evening Standard being great. I think it was on Thursday, did the whole piece. I think 70 or 80% of the teachers didn't even open that email. And those that have opened, they haven't read it. So, for me, it's again, the only way we're going to make a change uh, uh, on this issue and all other forms of issues that children go through, it's FGM still not a mandatory training on, 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 say, uh, on the child protection trainings. Mm -hmm. Until that's mandatory, I can guarantee you, Hamza, 20 years time, we'll be having the same conversation. Until we change the foundation, Ain't nothing else nothing's going to change, I mean, nothing's going to happen. But some things have changed. I mean, it's we, the, the first FGM helpline, with the NSPCC. Yes. Um, Daughter of Eve. Again. Consult with that, yes. Um, <laughs> we have the first FGM <laughs> clinic in Maine. Ireland. Yes. Um, and I know there's a, there's a girl called Ifrah, Ifrah I think. Ifrah, Ifrah is a yeah. very good friend, yes. Yeah, I've worked with Ifrah for many years. Who's campaigning there yes, in, in yes. Dublin and, and doing quite She's a lot of Absolutely, she's done a lot of work there, yes. Um, so some changes are being happening. What we have yeah. right now is obviously in Egypt. Egypt's currently uh, prosecuting Egypt. a doctor yep. uh, for, for killing a 13-year-old young girl, uh, whilst obviously mm -hmm. a, a, a operation of I mean, this is the one involved. that came up on the press. So many have died. Have before, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, the UK is first, obviously, doing its first prosecution of FGM right now. But the French have been a lot better at doing this than the British have. Um, and, and why do you think that is? Oh, God. A lot of people attack me for, for saying this. But I think what the French, I mean, I can't remember I'm going to say this, but that they got it right for some reason. Because mm -hmm. we know the French doesn't get it right for a lot of things that we don't want to associate <laughs> ourselves with. However, on this issue, and I was quite lucky while um, there was a research process for the documentary, uh, mm -hmm. which Channel 4, a case came up in France and I managed to go and actually witness a case myself. And it was very difficult to watch a mother being prosecuted. And even with this particular case, it was, it was, and people I think have this idea it's very easy in the France. It's not that very simple to, yeah. Um, what the, well, if what I give an they, example, what, they, what, they do that's what they do that's different is, first of all, they don't even have an FGM Act, number one. Okay. They don't have an FGM Act. They use the Child Protection Act and what we have here at GBH, if an adult gets yeah. mutilated. And they, their response has always been, violence is violence. We're not going to tiptoe around it or make mm -hmm. it look or make it more fashionable. However, they do recognize FGM is a complex issue, but we cannot shy away from it. So how do they detect it? How do they, how do they, to be able to prosecute, you have to detect well, it. Well, it's, it's part of their mandatory training. This one pushing for, it's part of the safeguarding mandatory training. Also in France, it's um, children get regular checks. Obviously, I, used, I thought it was mandatory, but I recently found out for the inquiry, it's not actually mandatory. You don't actually have that done, but it's encouraged. So every child, whether you're black, white, green, every child in France gets examined, whether they've had their dental uh, checks, immunization and FGM is now part of that to check 
I personally don't think children should be physically be checked for FGM. I think um, offering parents the right prevention work. So for me, when a mother presents in a maternity ward, the midwife plays a key role in ed educating that mother. Mm -hmm. If when she has a daughter, that could be flagged up in her red book and then the whole visitor can pick up on that conversation again. So for me, there are the other ways the of the checking. The prevention aspect Absolutely. Of it. For me, prevention is such a key, key component to this campaign. But a, a lot of people are, are now worried about the fact that it's the, the checking aspect of things mm. and that um, obviously the idea is floating around to examine mm. these young girls at the start of each term yeah. um, at schools by the school nurse um, to see if they've got undergone FGM over the holidays. I mean, I know you advocate for prevention work, yeah. but do you think that this should still happen? Do you think that I think at some point at it will happen. If, for ex I mean, if, for example, there is a clear indication that this child might have undergone FGM, it, they'll be checked like if a child went any form of sexual abuse. So if a child was molested by a family member, mm -hmm. they'll still be checked. So it would have to be, it would take this, they would use the same route. But would, it, would this be for, for every child, every young girl, or would it just be for I don't, I don't the girls from the at-risk? I don't, I don't, I don't believe it will be. I think the the, the new uh, 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 plans. They one of the things they want to introduce this referral. I think this is where a lot of people are getting confused. So if a woman who presents that she's gone for FGM has a daughter, the midwife will have a conversation with her, and in that conversation, if it comes up, and, and let me tell you, a lot of the women have been quite open. Some mm -hmm. of them have said. Oh no, I'm not going to get my daughter to have FGM type 3 done, which is the pharaonic type, the smiles yeah. we refer to. But they would say, well, FGM one. type 1, you know, the s if the mother says something like that, she'll be referred to social services. But that doesn't necessarily mean she'll be on the child protection list. Again, social services will come in and That's do nice. some prevention work with mm -hmm. her and go from there. Because, and again, again, I go back to my own example. I did not think there was anything wrong with FGM. No way. I did not. And I grew up in Europe all my life. I think people have this assumption. Because you grew up in the West all your life, you are against FGM. No, it doesn't work like that. But because that practice nurse took the time to educate me and gave me that piece of uh, paper about the law, and I, it really just gave me a chance to think about it, then I realized nobody was talking about it. So for me, I think that's important. However, this particular case that I witnessed in France, the mother mutilated her two eldest daughters years ago. She wasn't convicted, but she was warned not to ever do that because they obviously understood of, you know, her did this for her, you know, the whole usual story, yeah. you know, she did this for her children, da da da. But they, she was, uh, 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 just in case she has any other children, this will be flagged up. She had two daughters a couple of years later and the two daughters ended up being, she made them go for FGM again. So it was very difficult for me to watch somebody that was warned. So people, if they want to commit a crime, they will commit a crime regardless. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, if I want to prosecute, I want to prosecute cutters. And I've, m me doing some work with the police at the moment, that's really who they're after. They're not really after the mothers. It's the people who are actually doing the it. The people, I think if we need to- If you get rid of the service, then nobody absolutely. can go and Absolutely, and what, uh, Hamza, what worries me at the moment is, back home in villages, it was, these elderly women that were cutting these girls who didn't know about how the anatomy or yeah. the health. But the problem, um, the, the, my concern at the moment, a lot of these girls are being cut by medical professions who know the effects of FGM. So to me, that's 100 times worse than the old lady in the village because that person is in a position to prevent. To do anything that's, else. Yeah, exactly. And, and you've been campaigning on that a lot, and obviously, as mm. you said, uh, the, the documentary with, with Channel 4, mm. uh, The Cool Cut, has uh, recently nominated for BAFTA as well. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, that and, was. <laughs> and since then, obviously, yeah, it's, 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 it's a really good thing. I mean, you really delved into the topic quite openly. You, you, um, forgot, to, you forgot to introduce me as a BAFTA nominee, Hamza. Uh, ah, Come on. Oh, <laughs> I, sh I should have included that. should have no, included that. I remember that apologies. myself. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that. Uh, but it's, yeah, you've been, you've been nominated for BAFTA. You've been on uh, TEDx, obviously, to talk uh, on this as well. Um, it's, you were mentioned in The Guardian as one of the, the top 10 game changers. Um, it was the Women's Hour. Yeah, yeah. And it's, 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 I mean, the, the media and other organizations mm -hmm. are really singing your praises. Um, and especially when it comes to your campaigns and the cool cut, but are you getting the same sort of feedback from the Somali community? Do you know what? Interestingly enough, I thought I, w I might get backlash from the Somali community, but they were, obviously, I'm not going to say they were all supportive, but majority were very supportive. And I, I was actually overwhelmed 
but uh, the amount of support I had, especially from Somali women, and when I say women, I'm talking about women like my mum's age, who mm -hmm. came up to me and said, especially the scene I did with the boys where I'm, you know, cutting the yeah. plasticine. And I'm, I'll never forget, one of them said to me, Layla, for years I couldn't ever explain to my husband what I went through, but that, she goes, I pointed at she goes, that's exactly what happened to me. And for me, if I can give that woman, if I can tell her story in, in, in that way. format, absolutely, it was, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, so uh, the feedback the feedback been amazing. good. It's been but really good. But there are obviously the minority group I mean, who would say, Oh my god, who who, who she's shaming Somali, she betrayed I mean, there's, us. There, there's a there's a Somali <laughs> on that point, there's a Somali proverb that says Run Sheikh where Arab Sheikh. Um, and to tell the truth is to expose our shame. Um, and it's I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. I mean a lot of the, the for the ones that are giving you some pushback, um, you're getting some back from it's not that they're against FGM being banned. Is it just uh, against your methodology and the way you are presenting things? Is, uh, it, is it the shock factor no, of things? No, actually, the, 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 ba the shock, shock factor. It's funny. You, you, you call it shock factor. You should come to my family in our living room. <laughs> That's how we le lead our life all the time. But for me, um, I just wanted to give people the facts. And if that comes across as shocking, mm -hmm. obviously, I did use some tactics in there. Obviously, like the, in the film, when I put a pink vagina booth in the middle of South Bank. Of course I was trying to be shocking. Yeah. But I wanted people to come in there and see. They thought I was going to talk about Vijazo at one point, but that's not the case. But maybe, but, but the, 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 the backlash from some of the people from my community wasn't necessarily of my tactic. It was the fact that I was a Somali woman. It was like, oh my God, you shamed us by talking about this. And I remember somebody saying, this is our Arab turn, stop talking about it. And I said, mm -hmm. no. Actually, you know the good thing that came out of the whole documentary that a lot of people, a lot of Somali people, fed back to me because a lot of Somali women believed FGM was only practiced within the Somali community. And it, it's that's a lot the great wider. thing that came up. That was the good thing that came out of that documentary because a lot of them thought, wait a minute, it's not, it's not our thing anymore. And that's what I'm trying to point. It's not something that we should be hiding from. Come on, we raise money for warlords, but a woman decides to speak out against FGM protecting children, really you get attacked. It's like, what but the hell's wrong with us? Uh, but a lot of the a lot of things when you talk about warlords mm. or Somali politics mm. or anything else back home, um, the most influential people are either politicians, the Somali elders, or the, the religious scholars. Uh, how successful have you been in attracting the support of either one of these three camps? I mean, it's Do you mean politicians, Somali politicians or British? Uh, politicians? Somali politicians and as well as obviously Somali elders, because if you if mm. impact the Somali elders, then it goes to Somali politicians. Yeah. We take the politicians out. It's the the elders, the clan elders, and the, the religious scholars. How effective have you been in getting them to support the campaign? Um, uh, to be honest, Somali mothers listen to them. Oh, absolutely. And I've always said, you know, we do need to work with community leaders. You know, the, the people, w whether it's a woman or a man, mm -hmm. who can have such influence. But my fear is sometimes, who are these people? It comes back to because sometimes you could potentially say that person is the community leader, but that person could potentially be a misogynist. So it's like, do you want to, do you know yeah, what I mean? But, but it's the, the support hasn't been the same. I mean, it hasn't we, been the if same, we, if we no. Look at, if we look at the class campaign, if we look at the remittance campaign, all of these youth or charitable or yeah. uh, community uh, organizations I'm being, have I'm come too together. I'm being too political correct now. No, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, all these, all these true, organizations no, have come no, together, they haven't. But, but they haven't backed you in the same way. No, they haven't, absolutely. No, I, and I'll be honest. If you look at the campaign, every single one of them has signed, you shouldn't do meetings, everyone's no, coming together. No, no, no. I think what I found with my own community, it's, there's been a compliment behind the camera. But, no, but nobody, wants to, front, nobody wants to come to the front, to the forefront. And those who have come to the forefront, they're very... Um, politically they correct have, well. Yeah, politically correct. And they, they, there's only a certain limit, they would say. I mean, the only person who's been, who I've absolutely loved in the way he speaks about this subject, Sheikh Dalmar. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know who I'm yes. talking about. Oh, he's amazing. I, and when er, whenever he talks about FGM, and this is why I have a lot of respect for this man, he talks about it in the context of violence against women and girls. And we rarely see that when, so for me, it's not like just working with any uh, community leader or any scholars. It's, you need someone like that who talks about it in that context. I mean, he, he was one of the first uh, 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 scholars or sheikhs or community, whatever we refer to him as, who said, this is against our basic human rights. That's what we need to hear from our scholars. Yeah, not 
this idea of because I've I've been so, I've watched some of the, some of these Somali TV channels where these sh women would call and say, "Can we practice type one?" and their response was, "Well, you don't have to." So you have to be very specific about there it. Has to be, yeah. I mean, so there, really there hasn't been. Yeah, I agree with you. There hasn't been a lot of backing from the big Somali organisations, yeah, as you would say. And silence is consent, in and my opinion. Abs oh, you, <laughs> you. Well, I use that. It, it, and line. And this is what it is, absolutely, so absolutely. It, it, and it's not just it's FGM, though. It's not just FGM. It's any issues regarding women and children. We are silenced too. That's what, really what do you consent. think needs to be done to be able to change that? I mean. If, if we can rally together for the Qaeda campaign, if we can rally together for the for the remittance campaign, I mean, don't get me wrong, the remittance mm. campaign is a big thing. I yeah, agree. But if I look between Qaeda and FGM, I think FGM has a bigger impact on us than Qaeda does. In oh, my of opinion. course it so does. But why is everyone <laughs> rallying behind Qaeda and not behind because, FGM? Because because Qaeda, you're not, uh, uh, you know, you know, you're not, uh, um, you're not messing with the patriarchal system where FGM you are. Because you stop FGM, our girls could potentially be promiscuous. But with a Qad uh, discussion, I mean, I, I'm somebody who's kind of on the other side of, of this whole conversation because mm. for me, uh, imprisoning people who are ill, because this is me, the, psychothera the yeah. psychotherapy person coming through now, for me, uh, we, uh, we see addiction as an illness and to imprison someone for an illness. Mm. But well. somehow, people, but I think people feel more comfortable to, talk about, to that. talk about a leaf than a child who's been butchered really Fair. and we need to ask ourselves as a community why are we silent on something like that when yeah. our daughters are going through something like this but uh, not, not with the leaf this. I keep referring to it the leaf which it is but for me yes we do need I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it, we do need to talk about those issues but you're you're right in saying you know why it's so easy to talk about this and not that and, uh, and I see like some of the uh, I mean conversations and it's interesting we don't talk about sexual violence in our community we don't talk about domestic violence in our community so we really need to look at ourselves and say why why am I shying away from this discussion it really stems from the environments that we live in so something in our environment is telling us we should be ashamed and that's what we need to change and that's what we need to change I, I agree we're gonna have to leave it there uh, Leila thank you very much for coming oh, in it's been an absolute me. pleasure having you and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching The Briefing Room, and I hope to catch you guys next time. Oh, that was great.